he shooed me off the stage and made me feel bad. I know, right? So this year it's payback. So I want all of you to get out your mobile devices because this introduction is going to be awesome and you're going to tweet it. Because he gave me the idea himself. I was talking to him earlier in the hallway and he referred to himself as the Paris Hilton of atheists. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, P.C. Myers! Oh yes, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Yeah. Okay, get to work. Get to work. Get to work. Okay, first of all, where is Rebecca? Rebecca Watson. I just yelled at her to get her butt down here. Yeah, she's got. She's got to show up. Hmm. Okay, she's she's holding up the show. Oh, there she is. Okay. And you want to come? Okay, this is, this is a small thing. As, as many of you know, Rebecca Watson gets tremendous amounts of shit on the internet. <laughs> we all know this, right? Uh, so a number of people on my blog got together and organized Where'd she, oh, there she goes. Here's some representatives of the community on my blog, and they organized a little something to give to Rebecca to make her feel better. Uh, so. Yeah, uh, I don't talk all that loud, but I'll try. Basically, this is a bunch of, this is a bunch of postcards and t-shirts, and I think there's some necklaces in here as a sort of like anti-elevator gate. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay. Now get back to work selling my merchandise. <laughs> oh, after that feminist talk, I feel so conflicted. Anyway, okay. I've, I've got to warn you because the talk I'm going to give here is very different from the ones you've heard all day long. I've noticed every, all the talks today that have been these great sweeping themes, you know, things like atheism, and rage, and women, and, and rationality, and all this cool stuff. And I'm doing a little tiny question, an itty bitty, bitty little question. Uh, what I'm basically going to be doing here is I'm going to be taking one creationist point and pounding it to death. Yeah. So, one way to visualize this, this is, a, this is a spoiler alert, imagine creationist mouse in my left hand, sledgehammer in my right, and wham, and then I do it 20 more times. And at that point, the mouse is pulp, but as you know, this is a zombie mouse, so it will rise from the dead and keep pestering us. I'm sorry about that, I, I cannot get it, rid of it completely. The other bad thing about these zombie mice is that they're brainless, so the shooting them in the head thing doesn't work. <laughs> Don't even try. They just keep coming and coming. Okay, so anyway, small point I'm going to address is one problem of, of, of uh, the junk in your genome. And I'll hammer on that for a while. If you think that's really boring, you can leave right now, and I will mention that as I told Rebecca to get to work, uh, she runs Skeptical Robot, and she is selling Peringula merchandise. Feel free to spend money. Okay, that's, that's the end of the commercial. Um, okay, so what I want to talk about is, is genomic junk. And I want to talk about it because, as was mentioned earlier in the talk, the creationists have made a mistake. They have made a prediction, a testable prediction. And I'll just give you some examples of the kinds of things they say. This is, this is good old Bill Dembski. And what he said here is uh, a distinction, that intelligent design, he says, is not a science stopper. He says, real science is a science stopper. I know. Anyway, he's saying that, that, that it's not a design stopper because it can foster inquiry where traditional evolutionary approaches obstruct it. And he specifically mentions the idea of junk DNA. 
And he says that there's an evolutionary view would say that we expect a lot of useless DNA, which is really peculiar because no evolutionist predicted this ahead of time. On the other hand, organisms are designed, we expect DNA as much as possible to exhibit function. Prediction. We can test this. If most of the genome is entirely functional, if there's no waste in space, if it's really efficient, then that proves that panadaptationist evolution is true. No, they say it proves that creationism is true. The other way it can go is if there's lots of junk that says, that, well, that's falsifying a prediction by creationists, and we're done. They're, they've been disproven. This is our goal. Stephen Meyer says much the same thing. Uh, so he says, uh, thus, far from being dispersed sparsely, haphazardly, and inefficiently within a sea of non-functional sequences, uh, genetic information is densely concentrated on the DNA molecule. He says this, information densely concentrated on the DNA molecule. Now, some of you here are biologists, and you know you can go onto the NIH website, and there's a, there, the full human genome is right there, and you can go browsing through it. And the one thing we know is, no, it's not densely packed with information. It says, okay, far from containing a preponderance of junk, non-protein coding regions that supposedly perform no function, the genome is dominated by sequences rich in functional information. Prediction again. Now, what I wanted to talk about today is whether this is actually true. And I'm going to show you that no, it's not. First thing I have to do, though, and this is where I have a little trepidation because you've had all these exciting talks today, I'm going to teach you some molecular biology. Yeah. Okay. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> Man, I wish my students would respond that way. <laughs> okay, so, so here we go. Here's, here's a piece of DNA. I'm just showing you a piece of DNA, and I'm going to introduce you to a couple of terms. These are familiar terms to molecular biologists. When you look at a chunk of DNA that has a gene in it, what we see is that there are a couple of regions associated with it. There's something called a promoter way back at the beginning. And what this is is the site where uh, transcription will start, where an enzyme will come along and start making RNA. There are also a couple of regions called the UTRs, the untranslated regions. I'll explain that in a moment. And then what you find is in the genomic regions, in the gene regions, there's those things I've colored in pink up there, uh, which are called exons, and then there are these things called introns. Are you learning things yet? Okay. <laughs> We're getting there. So there are these cool things there, and they're, they're, they're important. Um, what happens during uh, the expression of a gene is, as I mentioned, there's an enzyme that will land on that little green blob over there on the promoter, and it will go scooting along the DNA, and it will make copies of it is in the form of M messenger RNA. So that's this step. It just takes that thing and copies it. Now, fortunately, to help you out here, I brought some DNA with you, with me. <laughs> Greatly amplified in size so you can see it, okay? So here's a strand of DNA, and it's just illustrating the very same thing that you see up on the screen behind me. Uh, I've got some fluorescent pink regions here, which may be hard to see in the back of the room. I don't know, can you see them? Okay, good. There's a fluorescent pink one, there's a fluorescent pink one there, and there's a fluorescent pink one there. This is one gene. It happens to be the gene for beta globin, which is a protein that's important in your blood cells. This is the, this is the one that binds heme and gives your, your blood that bright red color. So we got this thing here, beta globin. There's the gene. As I said, it's going to be, trans, it's going to be transcribed by that enzyme. What it will basically do is make a copy of the piece I'm holding up there. So there'll be a piece of mRNA that is a copy of that including the pink and the white regions. Now, that's kind of interesting because, as I mentioned, there's introns and exons. What happens in the next step? That messenger RNA gets processed. Basically takes that piece of mRNA and comes along with little scissors and snips that and snips that. Pardon me if I don't do it because I have to tie it back together again. Uh, snips those pieces out and splices the pink parts back together so that you get that little short chunk up there. 
And that's the actual piece of RNA that will then go out into the tissue, into the cell, and be translated into a protein. Now notice right away, something funny has happened here. There's the gene. All that white stuff gets cut off and thrown away. That sounds kind of wasteful. <laughs> but that's what happens. It's going to throw that away and splice together the, the pink bits to make a functional messenger, messenger RNA, which will then be translated into the cool protein that you see up there. Now, that Dembski quote says, said something very peculiar. It said that scientists, those evolutionary biologists, uh, had predicted this sloppy genome. And no, we hadn't. This was a total surprise when it was discovered. You know, everybody thought very sensibly, very rationally, that the molecular genome would be nicely engineered so all the genes would be in a nice chunk. And we'd just copy them off, you'd be done. But now we got this elaborate splicing step. We also thought it would be simpler than that because the first genomes that were studied were things like this. So here we are, this is uh, E. coli and yeast, which some of us will be drinking tonight. <laughs> and when you look in E. coli, you do not see this nonsense. You see the genes all packed together in one piece. You just copy off one piece, there's the gene, there's the, there's the transcript. That's what you do to make the protein. Uh, and when you look in yeast, you see the similar sorts of thing. You also see, when you look at this, See all those little blue rectangles? Each of those is a gene, and there's little black regions between those. Those are little spacer regions, and it's mostly gene. It's almost all gene, 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 packed together. When we started sequencing other creatures, like humans, we got a different result. So there's another diagram, this one that says C, human. Uh, that's, that's the human arrangement. And what it's illustrating is the location of genes. There's epsilon, gamma, uh, gamma A, and gamma, gamma B, and there's beta globin. It's the same gene I'm showing you here. But this isn't to scale. I've got to show you something else. That, that's, what I, that's why I brought all this rope with me. <laughs> so let me try this. I, I'm, I'm going to spread my DNA among you. You'll hold that. So I have, I have this deep fear that it's going to get tangled somewhere along the way. We'll see what happens. OK, there's another piece. Let me pull this off. OK, you people in the front row, grab that as it comes by. OK, let's, let's stretch it out. Let it, let it go so it slides on out. We'll keep going here. Keep going. OK, we're not done. Okay, let's go a little farther. And you notice here, I've, I've just exposed another, another region that's painted pink. There's another gene right there. We'll just keep going and going. Man, I brought a lot of rope. Anyone want to try any bondage later? <laughs> We're equipped. Okay, we keep going, we keep going. There's another gene. Finally, we reach the end. OK, you see that it reaches all the way around there. Uh, this is 100 feet of rope. On this particular scale, each inch represents about 40 bases, 40 nucleotides. Now what I'd like you to do is look at the piece of rope you're holding. And if you've got some orange, pinkish bits on it, raise your hand. Over there, over there. Should be another one way up there. Anyway, the point is that when you look at this, this rope represents that stretch of DNA. It's got five globin genes on it. And look how sparsely distributed they are. All that white stuff. That's the mystery. There's those pink bits. There's that white stuff. What is that white stuff doing? Why is it there? Why? Why have we packed, you know, if I, if I snipped off those pink bits and held them up in front of you, it'd be about this long. And here it is on 100 foot of rope. 
So this is what we mean when we say rich in information. No, it's not rich in information. It's pretty loosely packed with information. I'm going to throw some numbers at you now. First thing I gotta tell you is I'm cheating here. I picked a non-representative piece of the genome, but I'm cheating in a way that argues against me. This is about 50,000 bases total in this 100 foot of rope. And on it, we've got five genes. And each of those five genes is broken up into uh, three exons, right? That's not typical. The average gene that you find in the human genome contains about eight introns. It's broken up into nine pieces scattered along the rope. Uh, as it says here, the average exon size is about 170 base pairs. So it's itty bitty. And the average intron is over 5,000. So you've got to think all your genes are splintered into these little tiny bits that are scattered at long distances apart on a large space of, of DNA. Another thing, the human genome contains about 20,000 genes. The human genome is about 3 billion base pairs long. All you got to do is do the math, and that tells you that the average gene is about 1,500 base pairs. It's broken up into eight fragments, over 43,000 base pairs. And I remember I just told you this rope here represents 50,000 base pairs. So your average gene is kind of scattered all over the place along this. And furthermore, that they are in a sea of bases about 165,000 base pairs long. What that means is I would have had to buy two more ropes and attach them to the ends, ropes that were completely unlabeled, that were just white and mysterious, and we don't know what's on them, with one gene scattered in little tiny pieces along this one piece. But the rope cost about 10 bucks, and I was cheap, so. <laughs> okay, so you get the idea. First of all, it's really sparse. These genes are scattered all over the place, and they're broken and fragmentary in strange ways that require transcription and then splicing them together in order to make the functional transcript. How weird is that? That is something we never expected. It's really strange. It seems really, really stupid and inefficient. Some intelligent designer, right? This is what he does. When you do the full calculations and you look over the whole genome and you ask, okay, how much of that genome is dedicated to the pink stuff, to actually making genes? Uh, about one and a half percent. So only one and a half percent of your genome is making proteins. What is the rest of it doing? And that's where the, that's where the dilemma comes in because the creationists would love to tell you, oh, it's all gut uses, it's all important and functional. Uh, the molecular biologists will tell you, no, mostly it's junk. It doesn't seem to do anything. And I have to show you why. First of all, though, I want to explain to you that there is more than just those pink areas. Uh, one of the things that good old Billy Dembski has said is he's, he's very thrilled. He says, okay, there are non -code, there's non-coding DNA in eukaryotic genomes that encodes a language which programs organismal growth and development. And I haven't colored it in there, okay? It's in the white parts. He's very excited about this, but he shouldn't be because developmental biologists have been talking about this for 50 years, okay? This is not news. We've known this for a long time. What kind of language is encoded there? Well, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna dazzle you with some complex diagrams here. Uh, this is a kind of standard developmental diagram of a bunch of interactions in a really interesting organisms. This is in the nematode worm, C. elegans. And what this is, I know you're gonna be thrilled at this, this is the recipe for making a vulva. <laughs> okay. Which is really cool. That's one of the most thoroughly studied organs ever. <laughs> Who'd have thought it? Anyway. Yeah, worm vulvas are exciting things. I could spend hours staring in the microscope at them. Uh, 
what this is illustrating is that there are these different genes that play a role in building the vulva. Uh, for instance, there's one up there called vul. That's short for vulvalus. And this is a tragic mutation, because if you mutate that gene, no vulva forms. And instead, you get this kind of <laughs> Barbie doll sort of nematode. <laughs> and it's even more tragic than that, because it turns out that nematodes can self-fertilize. They don't need to have sex in order to get pregnant. And so you've got this poor nematode with no vulva, and she impregnates herself spontaneously, and she starts filling up with little babies and getting bigger and bigger, and no way out until they rupture mom and explode her, and then they escape. Isn't biology cool? OK, yeah. Anyway. And there's another gene there that you see, MOV. MOV, can you guess what that stands for? Multivulva. <laughs> there's actually a gene, you mutate this, and the worm makes vulvas all over the place. <laughs> see, biology's even cooler now, isn't it? <laughs> but the important thing in this whole diagram is, is these, whoa, what happened? Okay, something funny is going on. Come back, come back. It was just getting good. <laughs> there we go, okay. All right, so anyway, th th what this is illustrating is multiple cells. As you might guess, to make a vulva takes coordinated action among multiple cells to assemble. They have to make the inner lining. They've got to make the outer supporting cells. They've got to make skin surrounding it. You know, a skinless vulva, would not exciting. So you've got to have all these pieces in place. And it all, all these genes have to interact. And what this is showing it's called an epistatic diagram, and it's showing all the interactions between these cells and genes. So all these cells have to talk to each other. The anchor cell up there is a, is a key cell that says, okay, all the cells next to me, you are supposed to make the vulva, and the cells over here make the other, other bits of this region. And so there's a set of interactions that affect these various genes in there. So we work this out in great detail. We know that genes talk to each other. Here's another example. It's a little less tit titillating. Uh, this is how you make endomesoderm in an echinoderm. Okay, those of you who are titillated, I want to know who you are. <laughs> oh, okay, kinky stuff, yeah. Anyway, so what this is, it's the same thing as the last diagram. What it illustrates is that all these genes have to interact with each other. They have to send signals to each other. You have to turn on one set of genes if you're going to make mesoderm. You have to turn on a different set of genes if you're going to make endoderm. So all these genes are working together to assemble these, these, this elaborate structure. And what it's showing is that when you compare different species, you see very s deep similarities, and you also see key differences, which is kind of nice. But anyway, what this is telling us, all of this is telling us, is that yes, there is a secret language of the genome. Genes have to be switched on and off, and the question is how? And the, the answer is uh, the genes have these things, which, so what this is is an illustration of a piece of DNA wrapping around up there. This over here is the enzyme that makes messenger RNA. So if you hold up one of those pink regions over there, remember my, those pink things I said that there was an enzyme that had to land on one end and scoot along to make the messenger RNA? That's the enzyme. Why does it land there? Well, it has, it, it's only going to land there if there are signals there that say this is a good gene to turn on. So there are a set of things called promoter elements and enhancer elements that may be scattered all over the place. They can be many hundreds of thousands of bases away from the gene itself, and they all got kind of pulled around, and they bring these proteins around, and that encourages the enzyme to land there and start making it. And if the cell lacks some of those proteins, the gene is turned off. If it has proteins that interfere with the binding of the enzyme, the gene is turned off. If it's got the right combination of proteins there, it turns on the gene. So what this is telling you is that there's a bunch of interesting stuff that's not part of the coding region, that's not part of the pink region of, of this diagram DNA. It's somewhere floating off beyond, and it's scattered around, and that's important in regulating genes. Now you might ask, how much of the genome is dedicated to that? Okay, we've described 1.5% as belonging to coding regions, the pink stuff. And you might be asking, how much? Is it 98% that's involved in this kind of coding? And no, I'm afraid it's not. It is about 3%. Okay, so 
One and a half is coding. 3% is this important developmental function of regulating switching genes on and off. We're up to 4.5% of the genome accounted for and doing something. Aren't you proud? <laughs> okay. There's also some other regions of the DNA that are important. Uh, biologists here know this stuff. There's things like ribosomal RNA, transfer RNA. There are, there's a lot of really cool stuff being done on microRNAs right now which seem to affect ex expression. But all of these are small little regions that may be present in many copies. So like tRNA is present in 4,400 copies, but it's only 100 base pairs long. That would be two inches on my little rope there. So they don't add up to much. When you add all of this stuff up, all the stuff that's functional, that we know is functional, um, we got a grand total of 5% of your genome is not junk. Okay, at least 5%. Maybe there's more that's functional. We don't know. We got to ask. We got to probe around and figure out, okay, what does the other 95% do? We've got some answers. So here's, I'm going to talk about another case. This is something we know what it does. It's not very exciting, though. And this is structural DNA. So this is an example. What I've got illustrated up there, there's a chromosome. And chromosomes have recognizable morphology. Uh, they have a region somewhere near the middle called the centromere. And this is a region that's grasped by various proteins during mitosis and meiosis. It's, it's kind of like the handle on the chromosome that the cell uses to manipulate it and push it around. And then at the very end, there's these things called telomeres. And let me just talk about telomeres for a minute. Telomere, telomeres, when you actually zoom in and look at the molecular sequence, there is a typical telomere sequence. TTAGG, 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 TTAGG. Have you memorized this yet? Okay. <laughs> That's what you got repeated over and over and over again. What is this stuff doing? We know what this stuff do is doing. And it's kind of embarrassing for the cell to admit this. <laughs> Here's what goes on. When the cell goes through replication, when it actually duplicates its DNA, it's got an enzyme that scoots along the enzyme, makes more, scoots along DNA, makes more DNA, okay? This enzyme is buggy. It gets to the end of the chromosome and it screws up and doesn't copy to the very end. So every time there's a replication, the chromosome gets shorter and shorter and shorter. Now, some of you might be computer programmers, right? Anyone, any computer programmers here? Yeah. Okay. Even if you've just taken an introductory computer science course, you know this. There's a very common function that you might want to implement in your code, something to duplicate an array. You want to make a copy of an array. So you have two copies of the array. And you know that what if you, if you wrote your program to do this, and what you found was that every time you ran it, it duplicated the DNA, but you had a bug in it, so it didn't copy the last little bit of your array. Your boss would fire you, right? He'd say, no, you're, you're incompetent. That's so basic. You should be able to do this. But then you've got a brilliant solution. You're going to fix this problem by every time you go to copy, you will instead have a little piece, a little routine that adds random junk on the end of your array. So that if it copies and leaves one bit off, you're cool. It's OK. You haven't lost anything. Uh, the only thing is that you know, if, if you've got this little added bit of junk on the end and it erodes past that, then all of a sudden your program starts crashing because the arrays are being digested as they get processed. So this is, this is really bad program, but that's what the cell does. The cell has a bug in the enzyme that replicates DNA. It doesn't get to the end. So the cell solution is to have another enzyme that just tags random junk, T-T-A-G-G-G, on the very end of the chromosome. That's pathetic. <laughs> Fire the guy. He's incompetent at his job. But anyway, so it's, it's still got a function, right? It's got kind of a, a stupid function. But it's got a function. And you've got the, cent the centromere, which is a handle. You've got the telomeres, which are kind of to soak up this, this, this error in replication. You might ask, how much of the, of the DNA is represented in this particular function? About 10% of the DNA is this repetitive stuff. It just acts as a kind of mechanical handle for manipula manipulating the chromosome. OK, so we're up to 15% of the genome accounted for. Although this is kind of pathetic, right? <laughs> oh, man. 
You'd think if there were a god, he'd be smarter than this. Fix the enzyme already. Anyway. What about other things that are in there? We can also go prowling through those, those white spaces on the rope and ask what else is there. And I'm going to give you one example here. Uh, this is something called a long interspersed nuclear element. It's a line se sequence is what it's called for short. And what it is, is here's a piece of DNA, and there I've colored it in light blue. There's this little thing called a line. And it gets transcribed just like a gene. So it is a gene. It's got regulatory elements and everything. It's just like a gene. It's transcribed into messenger RNA. It goes out into the cytoplasm where it gets turned into a protein. In this case, the protein is called a reverse transcriptase. So line codes for reverse transcriptase. What does re reverse transcriptase does? Well, it recognizes the line messenger RNA. It binds to that, goes into the nucleus of the cell, and then sticks a copy in the DNA. So now you've got two line sequences here. It will do this over and over again. That's all this thing does is make copies of itself and insert them into your genome. Does this sound very useful to you? <laughs> sort of. It's going gonna, it's gonna, it to increases the amount of DNA there. It's going to constantly expand. It's just going to stuff in these copies. You might be asking yourself, OK, how often does it do it? Well, we can sequence your genome, and what we find is that there are 20,000 to 40,000 copies of this, and it makes up 21% of your genome. 21% of your genome dedicated to this thing, which does nothing for the cell, but it does a great job of making copies of itself. <laughs> this is the asshole in the office who sits on the photocopier and makes copies of his butt. <laughs> okay. That's what this gene is. What it is, is it's a relic of, it's a viral relic. It's a piece of a virus. This is what viruses do. They make copies of themselves using your own machinery. And we're riddled with them. 21% of your genome, almost a quarter of your genome, dedicated to this. So this is a parasite. It's parasitic DNA, classic parasitic DNA. And a huge chunk of your genome is dedicated to this. Uh, here's another example. This is something called a sign, which is short interspersed nuclear element. And what the sign is, is it gets copied into messenger RNA. That messenger RNA goes out into the cytoplasm. And then remember the reverse, transcripti reverse transcriptase made by the line? It's floating around. It recognizes the sign. The sign sequence tricks the reverse transcripti tr transcriptase into making a copy of itself in the genome. This is a parasite of a parasite. <laughs> so it's just making more copies of itself. It's a little short sequence, though, so it, you know, it doesn't add up too much, you would think, except that it just goes nuts. It makes so many copies. Your genome uh, contains 1,500,000 copies of sign sequences. One and a half million copies of this thing. You've got 20,000 genes. One and a half million copies of this. Something's out of balance here. This makes up 13% of your genome. Kind of impressive, huh? This, this is a really disgraceful office. OK, a lots of wastage going on here. Here's another example. These are called uh, endogenous retroviruses. And what these are, these are genuine, complete pieces of a virus. Uh, there's, it has three genes in there. There's a gag, which makes a, it's an enzyme that makes a sugar on the outside of the virus. It's got a pole, which is a polymerase enzyme that makes the enzyme to replicate the gene, the, the viral genome. And it makes this uh, end pro protein. It's a coat protein, envelope protein. So this is the complete assembly pieces to make a virus. Obviously, viruses aren't good for us, right? But they're lurking in your genome. They're thriving there right now. And in fact, uh, there's about 450,000 copies of endogenous ret retroviruses in your genome, which makes up 8% of your genome. Are you getting the message yet? <laughs> we know what a lot of that white stuff is. And it's garbage. Here's another one. Uh, these are called DNA transposons. Uh, and what a DNA transposon is, it's it's kind of a poor man's version of that line, because what it, it, doesn't make, it doesn't make duplicates of itself. What it is is it's a jumping gene. 
All it does is bind to some sequence elsewhere in the genome and cut itself out of the original location, put itself in the new location. So these genes just kind of hop around in the genome. They're bad for you because they cause mutations, okay? That's basically another mechanism for getting mutations. And you might ask, how many of those do we have to deal with? We've got 300,000 copies of those. That's 3% of your genome right there. So we can add all this up. So we know that 45% uh, of your genome, adding up all those categories there, is known parasitic DNA. Please call it junk. It's junk. It's, it's not functional. It's not to your advantage to have this stuff. 10% is structural DNA and 5% is functional. That's the coding sequence, the regulatory sequences, tRNAs, all that kind of stuff. So we can account for about 60% of the genome and about half of it is garbage. Now there's that remaining 40%. We don't know. We're working on it. That other 40% is job security for molecular biologists. <laughs> And we're going to, we're, the scientists are working their way through it. And we can make some predictions based on past performance. We can say, okay, what we expect to find is that most of this will be garbage. It won't be functional. It will just be random sequences. Uh, we already know, for instance, that another 1.5% are pseudogenes. These are broken genes that no longer function. There will be some surprises in there. There will be some fragments of that DNA that actually have function. And every time one of those announce is found, the creationists will announce, aha, we were right. The genome is fully functional. You have just found 0.001% of the genome that does something. Therefore, all of it's functional. But that, impose, that, that creates an additional problem. And this is the last bit I want to leave you with. This, this, this is an open question. This is something that Ryan Gregory invented. Uh, it's called the onion test. So let's say you do find something that's functional out there in the junk. Now you have to explain it. What does it do? And the onion te test relies on this observation. There's a, there's a number of species of onions. And one species here uh, has two times the amount of DNA we do. We don't have the most DNA. I know, your, feel, your competitive instincts are right now thinking, <laughs> can I become polyploid? No. So, this, this one onion has two times the amount of DNA we do. There's another one that has 10 times the amount of DNA we do. Why? Well, it doesn't have any more genes. What they have is larger variable amounts of junk, the stuff that we've been talking about, some of which may be functional, some fraction of which. But you have to explain, why do these two species have such different quantities of junk if it's actually functional? Because if you look at the onions, you know, they look like onions. They taste like onions. whoop de doo So this is the onion test. Any explanation for junk DNA must explain why these two species of onion need differing amounts of it and why they need so much more than humans do. That's the real challenge. We can find all this stuff. You know, why do they need more lines? Oh, I don't know. They don't, I don't think they do. So this is, this is the onion test. You've got you to answer the onion test if you want to explain junk DNA. Uh, another one that I'll point out is this animal, the fugu. Who's heard of fugu? Who heard of it because you saw it on The Simpsons? Yeah, yeah OK. I think that's the thing that's made it most famous is, yeah, it was featured on The, on the Simpsons. It's sushi. It's, it's a puffer fish, and it makes a toxin and it's very difficult to prepare and all this kind of stuff, and it's supposed to give you a nice tingly flavor, and sometimes it will kill you because it's such a deadly, it's a deadly nerve poison that it makes. So if it's improperly prepared, it can kill you. But that's not what scientists like about it. The cool thing about it for a scientist is it's got a tiny genome. Its, all, its genome is only 390 megabytes, or 390 megabases, excuse me, whereas ours is 3,300 megabases. So there's a huge difference. Why? When they sequence the fugu, what they find is fugu has managed to get rid of most of its junk DNA. It's greatly reduced the quantity of that white stuff in the rope. And it's not harmed. It's doing just fine. In fact, it's better than fine. It's killing people. It's only this big. 
which is kind of cool, as well as being flavorful. <laughs> so here's another question then. Uh, Dan Silverman, his genome size. <laughs> so his genome size is 3,300 million bases. Fugu's is 390 million bases. So can you account for the fact that Dave Silverman has eight times as much DNA as Fugu? It's a great mystery. I don't know what he's doing with it. <laughs> that could be. Yes, God has purified them and removed all the junk from their genomes. Anyway, so I've been kind of hammering on this for a while. You, we've, ha we've hammered enough. Let me conclude. So remember what William Dembski said back there at the beginning. Uh, he said this. Thus, on an evolutionary view, we expect a lot of useless DNA. Prediction one. If, on the other hand, organisms are designed, we expect DNA as much as possible to exhibit function. Prediction two. Which of those two is true? One. We're done. <laughs> right? Wasn't that easy? Okay. Uh, I really, I'm done. We've just dis we've just disproven creationism. We can all go home. All right. Do I answer questions or do I not answer questions? Man, she hates us all. She won't let any. Okay. Then I guess I will clear a space and get ro get rid of the rope and. Uh, we will look forward to, who's next? Brother Sam, okay, I'm all for it. <laughs>